welcome to your episode 328 of the At Percussion podcast. My name is Ben Charles, and today we're recording part two of the Christopher Dean tribute episode. Uh, I will keep the introduction very brief here. If you want the full Christopher Dean introduction, you can listen to episode 327 to get that. But very briefly, Mr. Dean uh, was the professor of percussion at the University of North Texas from 2000 until 2021. Prior to that, he was in North Carolina performing the Greensboro Symphony and teaching at East Carolina University. Uh, he passed away tragically at the end of 2001, and so we're going to celebrate his life and artistry today on this episode. We have a distinguished panel of guests today, including former Dean students and colleagues. So joining us as my co-pilot for this episode will be Brian Nosny, who's the professor at McNeese State University. Hello again, everyone. Hey, Brian, welcome back. And Brian Zader, who's the professor of percussion at Texas A&M University at Commerce. Hey, everyone. Honored to be here. And next up, we have Tim Fierce, who's the percussion professor at University of Texas Permian Basin. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Of course. And the illustrious Ed Smith, who was a colleague of Dean at the University of North Texas. Ed is the vibraphone and gamelan professor at UNT, and he's also a dance musician on the faculty at SMU. Welcome, Ed. Thank you very much. It's an honor to talk about my hero, Christopher Dean. Of course. And last but certainly not least, Carol Stump, who is the former timpanist of the Charlotte Symphony, as well as the acting principal timpanist of the South Carolina Philharmonic. Welcome, Carol. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you guys. Of course. Well, I thought we would maybe work a bit in chronological order here. Uh, Carol knew Chris first from his North Carolina days. So, uh, Carol, you mentioned that you were very proud to represent Chris's North Carolina days on the tribute concert that we all did at the University of North Texas. Um, you knew Chris very well before most of us even met him. So what can you tell us about Chris's younger days? And was he very much the same person that we all knew and loved in Texas, or was he different in any way? What a fabulous question. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I think I figured out earlier that he had been in North Carolina for exactly 21 years, which is exactly the same time he was a professor. But he, and you guys knew him. Certainly he was different in that he wasn't Professor Dean. Whenever I hear that, I still kind of like go, what? <laughs> it still makes me, uh, just surprises me a little bit because he was Chris, he was our Chris. What I mean by that is um, he had a very, linear beginning. He was born in Winston-Salem, um, North Carolina, and went to Winston-Salem School of the Arts for his high school, which is quite something, and then to continue on and do his college there, too. So he had a very singular beginning, um, which is so not the Chris we all know and love. He's so expansive, which is actually kind of what I think I had the honor of watching happen. Um, he was exactly the same guy. It's like really funny to even say this, he was just as witty and just as sort of um, reflective. I don't know how to say that, um, but just getting started doing all that. Um, I also find it funny when I read his resume and try to hear, try to summarize what he did in North Carolina. He was, how do I say this? Like Mr. North Carolina, he was the whole state. It's funny to hear you say like the last thing he did was the Greensboro Symphony and teach at, at Greenville. Like this, this is like two opposite ends of the earth. So like. Whoa, yeah, but he also did everything in between. In between there is, is Raleigh and he was playing all the time in the North Carolina Symphony. And if he went West, he'd be playing with us in Charlotte. So he, he actually had this old beater van and would drive all over the state and play with everyone everywhere. Um, it reminds me of Jan, Jan is saying he, he never got rid of anything. And I'm sure that van outlived its useful life by, by many years. <laughs> I'm sure, and in fact, that brings me to my, the next thing I wanted to mention was, I'm sure you think of him, and we certainly all saw this when we were there recently, if we had forgotten, you think of him as this guy with like this incredible amount of instruments, right? Depth and breadth and every kind and size and thing and every, you know, well, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> and he didn't, he wasn't born with all that stuff. And this is an amazing tale. He was always, I remember right from the beginning, even he would like show me these little finds of things that he would get. He'd be like, oh, check out this symbol or check out this such and such, this thing I found or whatever. And I'm like, where are you, where are you getting this stuff? He's like, oh, you know, I, I play all over the state. And when I 
drive around in my van, I've had some time and I sometimes go through these little towns and I see what they have in the old music store that's still standing or, or the pawn shop or I end up in Aunt Mary's attic and find some marimba that was sitting up there. So he was, he was an artist at this. He could talk people out of stuff. He could um, just find things where you, you wouldn't ever think they were. And, and little by little, that's how he became this, you know, sort of this collector of, of amazing instruments. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I was at their house yesterday and I've seen his office and now I saw the inside of their house. And I would say uh, Emil Richards, I think, is the king of this. But second to Emil, I, I don't know anyone that has that sort of collection. It, it, it's amazing. And it's, it's surprising if you live in North Carolina because I, I was like, I'm still like confused because I live, I mean, I'm not from here. I'm from outside of Boston originally, but I'm like, where, where's this stuff? Like, where are you getting it? And he said to me, uh, here's a good story, he said to me, Carol, you just, just, just have to go, you know, just, just go to a pawn shop, just, you know, just go. So I think like, finally one day I grabbed a student of mine who is actually in college at that point, I think. And I was like, all right, let's, there's this, and it literally is this like a, a music store, but it was kind of a modern music store. It wasn't an old place, but it was very, very small. And it was less than a mile and a half from my house, really close by. And we're like, ah, my student, I think, who was also named Chris, which is also confusing. Um, he said, um, let's, let's just go in that place. So we went to that place and we each came out with a K Zildjian symbol. Mine is an old K, it's, it's, it's not a Constantinople, it's an Istanbul K, but it's, it's beautiful, it's amazing. And he got a modern one, but it's exactly what he wanted it. I was like, how did that even happen? And I know it's because Chris had just said, well, you just gotta go and see what's there. And I feel so silly because it was like practically on my doorstep and I didn't even know it was, was sitting there. And it's probably the best instrument I own and would never have thought to go in there if it wasn't for Chris, so. Um, that's a little hot tip from Chris. <laughs> um, I guess we all have to uh, just go to our local uh, pawn shops and everything to, to try to just find something. You never, you, you never know what you might find. I like it. That's, he was so spot on with that. I mean, that's how he, I, probably how he got almost everything that he owned. And in fact, I have, a, I have a little gift from him that I wanted to show you guys that he gave me one time that he found in one of these little ventures that he was on. And um, I wonder if you guys, you may or may not know what this, I mean, you certainly will know what it is, but if you know exactly what it is, I will be impressed. You know exactly, I don't know if you can see it. This isn't a good enough background to see yeah, it exactly. Some sort of triangle. Right. So yeah, but isn't, sort of isn't that actually, isn't that like actually a machining rod of some kind that's been exactly. bent? Yeah, 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 like the, the, the original yes. angle thing. Say that again, because you just the, found the original it. Abel triangle. Yeah, that's it. This is what Alan Abel modeled his triangle after. It's actually the rod from a Singer sewing machine. And this is what inspired him to make his triangle. Now, who else would find this but Christine? Where did he find it? I don't know, some attic in North Carolina somewhere. And then he gave it to me because, of course, I went to school in Philly. And so he knew, you know, we talked about Abel and Abel triangles all the time. He's like, no, you should have it. I said, Chris, I can't take it. He's like, you should have it. So I have this and it, it doesn't sound very good, frankly. So I can see why, but I can understand why he uses a prototype. There's some parts of the overtones sort of have like some potential. So I think that's um, why he, he um, Alan Abel that is decided to go on and make his struggle. But anyway, isn't that amazing to have one sure. of those? I can imagine how it ended up here and what, but it ended up with Chris, which is the most. Carol, nuts. I was gonna say, I, I don't know if it'll come through well on Zoom, but do you have a triangle beater? Could you, could you I strike afraid it for us once? That. It doesn't sound very good, but I'll do it anyway. Just so we could hear. <laughs> yeah. And I don't even know. I was like, you should have seen me. I was a wreck all afternoon running. Because I just got back last no, this morning. Oh, today, this afternoon. And I was running around going, oh, where's that triangle? Where are my beaters? I, I don't have a decent beater or anything. And I, I was trying to find a decent beating spot, which it doesn't really have. But um, it's OK. It's too, like, it's still monodirectional to me. Sometimes you can hear. Yeah, it's it's like I, I said, I, I don't know how well to come across on Zoom. It sounds like it's way more overtony than the Able, which is almost like a pure like bell sound. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, especially I'm not a fan of them, but um, 
and I can say that I'm from Philly, but um, uh, yeah, but I, it, but it has <laughs> there are similarities to it, which I think is, that's why he, why Alan Abel did it. But anyway, this is not to be about Alan Abel, but but about Chris actually finding a Singer sewing machine rod, Alan Abel, whatever you want to call this. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, guys? You know what I'm prototype. saying? Prototype, inspiration, prototype. prototype. Yeah, yeah. So that's so, a, that's a nice little uh, warm up, and and just to say that he basically, you know found all this stuff all over the state and then played everywhere in between. He wasn't just here and he wasn't just there. If you can find his older copies of his resume online, which is kind of hard to find, he'll tell you about all these different places that he played. And he really did Yeah, I was going to say, actually, I, if you Google like Christopher Dean, UNT, another, something, you can actually find his CV that has everything. Yeah, and some of that, some, I get really mad because some of them have North Carolina left off. It's just like, oh, yeah, well, he played in Greensboro Symphony and then he left. No, he did like so many millions of things. And actually, he started his Harry Anos thing. First time he played that was with Charlotte Symphony, and then he played it in North Carolina with the North Carolina Symphony in Raleigh. And then, boom, his name was out there. And he's played that with more orchestras than I can count. Um, and I, don't ask me how he got started. Just another Chris thing, you know, just, hey, let me figure out how to play that thing. Why not? I could be the best in the world at it. Give me five minutes, you know, it's Chris. Well, thinking about, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, Carol, you brought up the triangle. I can't think about uh, Christopher Dean and triangles without thinking about um, the uh, video of him. Uh, I think it's a video he did for Black Swamp Percussion where he demonstrated a triangle and uh, somebody overdubbed heavy metal music with it. There was this, if you search on Facebook, there is this uh, Facebook page called Progressive Triangle Core. And it was all everything having to do with like triangles. And every time you hit the triangle, there was just like this new, like, just like, dark like heavy metal and everything and um it used like this hashtag ting t-i-n-g and uh uh oh and oh actually it was from uh ken wiley's uh, simple steps uh for uh uh dvd and what was actually kind of funny is that in the video he was known as professor ting t-i-n-g in the video and everything and uh I, along with uh, two other people I went to UNT with, Jamie Esposito of Spectrum Ensemble and Rebecca Villarreal, uh, who went on to get her master's at CCM. And, uh, um, and I think she uh, has an, uh, works as the uh, subscription, uh, concert subscription manager for Detroit Symphony. Um, I, think, I, think, I think I have that correct. Um, but we showed him that video and he was just absolutely perplexed by it. And, then, <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard too. <laughs> but then, like, he played it again, and he literally just started bobbing his head to it. You know, it just like, it was the, it was the funniest thing, and it's one of my like, crucial Christopher Dean memories, and everything. And that that if you haven't seen Progressive Triangle Core, like that entire page is just an absolute gem. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. Never even heard of it. Sounds amazing. <laughs> I was going to just mention really quickly because uh, Carol had mentioned it. I, I did Google and find that uh, UNT res or CV. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, I will I'll screen share this so you can see. Um, but I, Carol, you can tell me this seems like it has pretty much everything going way back to 1979, Charlotte Symphony Orchestra, concerto yeah. performances. Um, so at the very least, this has a whole lot, if not everything, as well as uh, I saw somewhere down here, it has a list of his compositions. So um, yeah, if you if you Google enough keywords, anyone that's interested, you can uh, find this. <laughs> so Brian, I, have, I think you had something. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I actually have to say first, like I actually always thought of Dean first as a rock drummer. I think that was kind of where he almost got his start because I remember him telling me a story at one point that one of his early memories was that in high school or middle school or whatever, he would take his two fingers and he would, he would straddle the, um, the desk and he would go up and down and they would see how clean they could play Wipeout. Just do, doing the Wipeout drum solo. like. And I remember saying that and I'm like, all I could think is like this young Christopher Dean with a beard because you can't think of Dean without the beard, like trying to do that. So I don't know. I, I would imagine that he, Dean must have loved that at the end of the day. I, it kind of brought him back to his roots, maybe. I don't know. Now, so. now I'm sitting here on my desk, like trying to, and it's not happening. <laughs> I know, right? 
<laughs> um, but I was going to, you know, Brian, you mentioned that. It's funny, like, one thing when I think about old Dean, I actually don't think of him as a rock drummer. I think of him as a rock guitarist because there are photos of him. He had a, a rock band and he played guitar. And when I was at North Texas, I'm, I don't know if they're still doing this, but for probably a good 10 years or something, they did. Uh, my friend Kate and I started this. Uh, it, it was a cookie party for the, the percussion studio. And we were glad to hear it. It lasted after we left. I, I don't know if it's still going on. But every year they would, the percussion studio would get together and have like a Christmas cookie party, which I think the more and more it went on, it was less about cookies and more about alcohol. But uh, that being beside the point, uh, I know one year Dean went to this and someone had a guitar and they were playing it and Dean picked up the guitar and just started playing. And there, there's photos of it on Facebook and Ed, you might have been there, but um, yeah, apparently he was, he was a pretty serious guitar player too, which I, I never lived fact, to see. Can I tell the story about his guitar playing? Yeah, yeah, please. Because um, I think we were pretty famous for having a little mallet duo, vibes and marimba at the music camps at UNT. So we had that for quite a few years. But the very first time we played together at a camp, he brought out his 12 string. And we were both big fans of uh, Gary Burton's Matchbook CD, which had Ralph Towner and Gary Burton doing duos. And so he wanted to play Icarus, the, the iconic tune. And so, and he played 12 strings. So he acted like Ralph Towner. And so I was trying to act like Gary Burton, you know, but uh, it was one of my earlier beautiful memories of playing with Christopher Dean. And it wasn't even him on marimba. It was him playing 12 string guitar. Extraordinary talent, man. Hmm. Man. Well, Carol, getting, getting back to you for me, because I've known your name forever because of the fact that as far as I'm concerned, the best, solo timpani piece out there is prelude number one by christopher dean and so i've always seen you know it was that it was written for you so do you want to tell us maybe a little bit about uh that piece and where it's genesis and all of that sure sure so um when i first met him i guess i i heard this rumor recently when i was in texas i think that he wrote a two for quite a while when he was 19 or something which i know I don't know if that's true or not because it wasn't it didn't win the prize but actually i was just reading another interview with him and he finished it right before the pas competition so i think that maybe that's more the official date of when that was written but anyway i heard that i was in charlotte by then and somehow i heard him play it or something and i was floored i just i love etude for quiet hall and um because you know we're really good friends we have to understand this i mean i i don't know professor dean he's my colleague and we were also you know we were young, starting out percussionists, atypidists, whatever we were. And so I was like, ah, why don't you write me a piece like that? Just like kind of like a rib and kind of like teasing him. And he turned to me and said, what do, you, what do you want? Which I didn't expect because I was really kind of kidding. And I was like, well, right, agent for a quiet hall for Tiffany. And he said, okay. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and so that's how it happened. I, I, you know, I, really loved that piece and, and and was like wow he's gonna write a tiffany version of that okay i'll take it sounds great and so um he, he did write it i don't remember how long it took probably not too long um and my my copy says prelude on it the copy i paid for it says prelude it is not prelude number one it's, it's prelude because that's you know when you write your first prelude you don't know it's your first prelude right it's just prelude and also maybe that's the only thing he meant to title that. I don't know. I mean, I have an interesting story about three. I do know that two and four will never be published according to Janice. I don't really know what they are. And I know how three happened. So I have some theories on that. But um, anyway, it's just a prelude. So I, I refer to it as prelude, but prelude number one is fine too. So that, that's how it came to be. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully. I was going to mention uh, Janice did a, a beautiful, per or excuse me, Janice Carroll <laughs> did a, a beautiful performance of that at, at the Christopher Dean tribute concert. And I, I, I Carol was the, the only one that thought to do this. And I, I wish that more people had at the end. Uh, Carol, as she took her bow, she picked up her music and she held it up and she sort of saluted the music, saluted Mr. Dean in that way. And I, well, quite frankly, I don't think it would have worked for, uh, best between formations because we all have these big ugly black boards <laughs> with our music <laughs> <laughs> and template for memory so um but yeah it was like this list really sweet little moment that, that you uh gave that little nod to, to chris yeah it seemed obvious to me i was i thought everybody would be doing it i don't know why i just i thought i, I could do it because chris yeah 
Oh, well, you, you know why we didn't. <laughs> Big board yeah, right. holding up. When the first page turn happened in that Vesper team, I couldn't believe it. Ryan, right? You went into <laughs> Ben's music and like, I was like, what's going on here? It's like, yeah, I was like, you know, I barely have any time to do this. So, uh, Brian, you're going to do it for me. <laughs> I, I got an assist uh, on that one. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Sandy has an iPad, which I, I wanted to use an iPad, but I wasn't going to be the person whose iPad failed. So there we were. <laughs> yep. So, well, uh, since we've, you know, in, in some level of depth covered Chris's North Carolina years, I would like to uh, jump to Chris's Texas years next with uh, Ed here. Um, and I, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to say this, but uh, maybe because we're not actually going to edit the recording in. Ed made a beautiful and hilarious tribute to Chris several years back of, uh, it was a cover of Giant Steps with some uh, some Christopher Dean themed lyrics, which maybe if you poke around enough on the internet, it might pop up somewhere, but uh, we'll keep that an inside joke. But Ed, uh, while well, you and Chris have a very different artistic output, um, I've always sensed like a mutual admiration between the two of you. And while your artistic output might vary Greatly, um, you were very similar teachers to me, and that you were humbly, excuse me, humble people who cared deeply about their student success. So, what was Chris like as a colleague? Well, I think I gradually learned the his teaching style that inspired me so much. When I first met him, I was just blown away by his compositional output and also his beautiful playing. But I didn't know about his teaching style quite yet until the years as we got to know each other. And then I would, some students would come to my lessons and they would say, Dean said this, and, and a light bulb went off. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I started trying to dig in a little bit more. I learned about his Sherlock Holmes uh, voice, you know, and how he would help you find the solutions and stuff like that. So I, he was a huge influence on me on, on my teaching alone. Uh, but he was also a big supporter of me. I mean, I'm sure everybody feels that way, that he, was, he supported you in such a beautiful way. And for me, uh, he kept asking, when's, when's your solo CD coming out? Man, I'm going to buy your solo CD. I'm sorry I still haven't completed it, so I won't be able to give it to Dean. But he's always a, a big supporter of my music. And we would have just beautiful chats about the students and how we can support them more. He, um, I remember one... Oh, I'm going to go off on another track. One of my important memories of Dean is as one day we're walking out of the music building at sunset and we noticed this gigantic flock of black birds creating these incredible designs, which I, and at the point, at that moment, I didn't realize he was about to compose one of the greatest pieces in percussion literature. But we, we saw each other twice at sunset. And we just sat there for, you know, 20 minutes just watching this amazing uh, formations and I didn't realize he was already configuring notes and scales and patterns and everything so then eventually when he finally completed that, that amazing composition I, I just kind of had to bow to him <laughs> he was just so extraordinary so I was very fortunate to get to play with him you know he was a closet jazzer he could actually he could definitely improvise in the in the style he was a big fan of Gary Burton, along with other Vibe players. He was so thrilled that Gary Burton played on his Vibe at a music festival in Dallas. I think he might have had Gary sign it even, I think. I can't remember. But uh, uh, so during our summer music camps, uh, I would always ask him if he'd play a song with me. And he was always game. We played Time Remembered, which is a very difficult Bill Evans tune, and he played it beautifully. Uh, a tune that I wrote called Martha and Aaron, where I steal a little bit of Aaron Copeland's hymn in Appalachian Spring, and I put some material around it. And we actually have a video of that that I should probably post. I haven't posted it because of the sound quality is not the greatest because I think it's from a telephone. But I want I, I should post it because I would love to hear love for people to hear Christopher Dean play this style of music because he's really not known to be a jazzer. But anyway, he just inspired me every day. And uh, we finally had our last conversation outside his office, on his bench outside of his office. It was the last time I got to talk to him. And there he was comforting me, you know. And that's just the kind of man he was, you know. But I'm very thankful for that, that he um, assured me he's okay. And because uh, that was pretty much, pretty much a wreck at that time. 
um, I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say it's like it's so nice to hear this, like you know, and the way that you like had this mutual admiration for each other, and that was something that I noticed about all the professors at UNT, really. Um, but I remember I had one one lesson with Dean, and in the middle of my lesson, there was a knock on the door, and he opens it, and it was Ed Sof. Uh and Ed had forgotten his mallets for you know cymbal rolls on drum set the the, the night before, so Dean had had loaned him some. And so uh, he said, oh, oh, yeah, of course, no problem. So he takes his, his mallets back and closes the door. And just like so humble, he was like, that man right there is the reason that I don't play drum set. There's there's no need for me to. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you don't have to make it like a self-deprecating comment about, you know, like something like that. But like, I, you know, at the same rate, I, I get it. So, um, But I'm... since we're talking about him as a teacher, uh, after Mr. Dean passed, Zach Shear uh, who's a, a former student, posted uh, Mr. Dean's 45 lessons in 15 minutes, um, which I won't take the 15 minutes to to read all of these on the podcast. But again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the screen share of these in a second here. Um, but the first one, let me pop this up, and you can take time to read them all on your own. But the first lesson is music isn't hard. Bricks are hard. Music is time consuming. If you think of music as being hard, you have built a brick wall between you and your goal, which was like the most just brilliant thing. And uh, here's the second page of these. But it wasn't until I saw this list that I was like, I remember him saying literally every single one of these things in my lessons. But not only that, now that I'm a teacher, I realize I've said literally every single one of these things in my lessons. <laughs> so he had a, a profound impact on me as, you know, all of us, obviously, but just such a wise, wise man. And like I said, if you if you go on YouTube, you can you can find that list that I just screen shared. So Brian Nosny, I think you had something. I remember him getting back to kind of the Ed Soap store. I remember being in his office and one of the things that I believe is on the 45 is um, um, it's not when you do it, it's that you do it. And he sat there one, and he told me this story about, it was like one Saturday morning and he walked into the building to, he was going to go practice or he had just got to get something out of his office and he was walking by and they had a Suzuki class of all these, you know, like these children playing string instruments and he walked by and he saw some 10 year old, playing the Mendelssohn violin concerto and just destroy, just absolutely just, it was one of the most, he was like, Oh my God. And he went and he sat down in his office and he's like, why am I even bothering with this? Like, why am I even bothering doing this up when there's people like that out there? Why am I even bought? And he said it was this light bulb moment that he was just like, it's not when you do it, it's that you do it. And that was just the, I was always remember that. So that was like one of the most profound things that, it's an it's such a lesson that just is overarching to not just music but to anything in life. And so that listening to him say that about Ed Soap, I'm just kind of like, yeah, there's I can see connections there to that. You know that that just set off a light bulb in my head. I I totally just remembered this story. Uh, but there was one time I don't know if I had a lesson or if I was just in his office or what. Um, but there was some kid walking around selling chocolate bars. And you know, those fundraiser chocolate bars, they're terrible. <laughs> and so if anyone ever asked me, do you wanna buy a chocolate bar? I would probably politely decline. Uh, but the kid walks up to Dean and he says, uh, sir, I'm selling chocolate bars to, to help support my school orchestra. Would you like to buy one? And I think Dean pulled out his, I think he gave the kid a 20 and, and took one chocolate bar. But I mean, that's the kind of person he was just to support anything musical like that. So um, Brian Zader, I think you had something. I did, yeah. Actually, about the about the list, I think it was um, I had seen it before, and like all of all of us, we had used some of those. Um, uh, but I think one of the things that uh, I mean, there's so many things that we talk about that his memory, his music will last. But I think that teaching thing, and Ed was talking about it too, just the the caring that he has for the students. Um, and when I saw. Um, I actually talked to my students at a studio class and after Dean had passed away and um, I, I saw the, the sheet that Zach had posted and I was like, you know, what? I'm printing this out. And um, I, I think it's my due diligence to pass off something from my, you know, our good friend, our teacher, our mentor, and 
that is still up there on our bulletin board. And you know, most of my students never got a chance to, to meet him. And uh, I think that sheet is just a, a microcosm into his mind and just the way that he thought, because those were just things that were just him and were just natural and he didn't have to overthink it. That's just who he was. And like Carol talked about before, I thought that was great. You were like, that's kind of who he was back in North Carolina. So I think that even just those, those sheets that anybody can put that up there. And even if they don't know him, can have an insight in just his, his music, his teaching, his thoughts are just gonna continue from generation to generation. I just think that's uh, pretty, pretty poignant of that aspect just uh, of what those sheets and just an insight to him so it, going going along with this i'm going to flip screens over here to read this um after i after i had found out about dean's diagnosis i wrote him a an email trying to say things and he being so eloquent you know wrote me back this this wonderful you know um this wonderful message but he wrote something that it was just kind of speaks to everything that, that all of us are saying about his teaching this, this is a, a quote from him. He said, he said, teaching is such an abstract activity. One enters a building, expels ideas over gusts of hot air and leaves that building having no idea if anything was of help to anyone. I have always tried to see into the needs of whoever I am teaching at any given moment, a process that often goes fairly far afield from the all important curricular boundaries in the hopes that something said will lead to a more motiv to more, a more motivation beyond just learning a better way to paradiddle. And it's just like that's I, I don't know that you can summarize Dean that you're more than like better than that in my mind. It's just so perfect. That's what I got. Yeah, yeah I remember, um, you know, because we're kind of talking about like quotes and everything. Um, one of the most valuable quotes that Chris ever gave me was, um, you know, we've all had in lessons with Dean, we've all had experiences where um, we weren't really feeling good about ourselves either as musicians or as humans and dean was so good at peeling us off the ceiling and everything and what he was able to do was um i just remember this quote and i pass it along to my students is that it's your life it's worth fighting for and it is such a profound quote and there have been so many times where we think that you know for the sake of you know humbleness or humility, like we're not going to like inconvenience, you know, the professor to give you that signature so that you can, um, you know, so that you can then go graduate and, you know, defend your dissertation and everything. But Chris would say, it's your life, it's worth fighting for. And if there is one quote that I always share with my students is it's that. I was going to say, I have one, uh, one not profound thought and one profound thought to share here. My not profound thought is that I'm very proud. The second one on the list is the arms are for passion, the wrists are for precision. And I wish I could tell you exactly what it was, but I remember I was in a lesson and he kind of asked me, the arms are for blank, the wrists are for blank. And, and me being not a great student, I fumbled through and gave some answer. And I don't remember what it was, but I misquoted him. And he said, actually, what I normally say is such and such, but I like what you said. Uh, and so and I was just a variation on what he had said, but he got his little book out and he wrote down what I said. So I can, my claim to fame is that I'm somehow, and I wish I could tell you how, somewhat responsible for the wording of number two. <laughs> but uh, I, I shared some, <laughs> some memories in private with Janice and reading over this list, I was gonna say, we often think of being opinionated as a bad thing. And there's certainly, uh, can be a negative connotation to that, but Mr. Dean was just very opinionated. He had ways that he did things. Um, and it's funny because so many people have this warm and fuzzy memory of all their lessons and all this wisdom that was passed along to them. And I certainly get it. My memory is actually a little bit different. I disagreed with him a lot. Um, and in a, in a respectful artistic way, we didn't have shouting matches or arguments and I, I wasn't failing my lessons over it or anything like that but I had certain different views than him and I remember one of those views in particular he always said that marimba is a rhythmic instrument timpani is the only melodic percussion instrument 
And I understood what he meant by that, but I very vocally told him, I don't, I don't think so. I think I get what you're saying, but I think you need to play it as if it is a melodic instrument, because that's sort of like the, the background that I came from. And it's funny because we had all these discussions. And when I graduated, I, I never actually knew for sure if he liked me <laughs> in so many words. Uh, it was it, like, again, it was not a contentious thing, but I very clearly had my opinions and, and he had his, and they didn't always match up. Um, and it was funny, like, I, and I, I wasn't necessarily the best with always keeping up with him throughout the years, although I did keep up with him and I took a lesson with him around 2019. So obviously uh, toward the end of his, his life, um, and so, but it was like really nice for me, uh, the performers on the UNT concert, he actually selected himself before he passed away. And it was so redeeming for me to hear that he had picked me because it said that neither of us were wrong, even though he had his opinions and I had mine, there was room in the world for both of us. And he had at least some level of respect for me as I had much for him. Uh, in order to to choose me as someone to play on that concert, so that was that was my sort of thing, and it's like it made me so happy to know that that it validated me as an as an artist, if you will, that that Mr. Dean thought something of me and my maybe off kilter opinions. <laughs> um, but to move things along a little bit, um, speaking of people that Chris selected for this concert, Tim. Uh, you have a very special relationship with Chris's very difficult marimba solo, The Process of Invention, and you performed this on the Dean Tribute concert, and your recording of this piece has racked up over 8,000 views on YouTube, which is uh, quite a benchmark for a solo marimba piece. So what are some of the behind-the-scenes tales you have about working with Chris on this piece or just working with Chris in general? Yeah, um, so I've always been kind of curious about Process of Invention. I first heard uh, the piece performed uh, when I was an undergraduate at George Mason University. Um, at that time, a uh, very wonderful uh, marimba soloist and percussionist, uh, Paul Fadul, um, had played um, played it on one of his recitals. And so I was just been always like, I was just like, that's a kind of a cool piece. I'm going to file it later. And then fast forward, you know, a certain number of years, and and all of a sudden I'm working on it with Chris and everything. And you know, it was kind of interesting that the, there were, of course, you know, being able to work with a composer that, you know, working on a piece that the composer wrote, like that's a, that's a, you know, very fascinating experience. And, you know, it's very fortunate in our instrument that we get to do that so much, uh, you know, more than, um, than some other instruments might be able to. And there were, you know, the piece challenged me in the ways that it needed to challenge me in order for me to move to that next step. And to have Chris help me, uh, to have Chris guide me through that was truly extraordinary. Um, there were kind of two stories as I was thinking about this that I kind of, went, kind of wanted to share. The first thing was that, um, you know, I was kind of telling him I was sort of nervous to play it because, you know, I mean, it's process of invention and people that know, know it, like know that it's a difficult piece. And Chris said, Tim, you're going to miss notes when you perform it. You are going to miss notes. And although, you know, we obviously, you know, in our field because, uh, you know, and, and we are where we are because we strive for that perfection and everything, it was kind of interesting and, you know, really had a big impact on me to hear Chris say that about something that he wrote. Um, and there was another story for that. And this was actually earlier. And it was, um, I remember I got so frustrated um, like not, not like slamming. I was in like, I think it was room 115. I think it was, I, I mean, I didn't like slam my mallets, you know, up against the wall or anything, but I just remember like, just being like, it's just not, it's just not working. I'm sorry. You know, and I was, I was noticeably, uh, vis uh, visibly frustrated. And Chris said something and he said, well, you know, I wrote this piece and, you know, if somebody has that attitude towards it, it makes me regret ever having written it. And I was just like, uh-oh. And so that also put things in that right perspective. And, you know, it was an organic growth with that piece to be able to, um, to be able to play that piece. And uh, it's, you know, I know we always say that, you know, you know, something that Eugene Corporon says, and a lot of us say that our favorite piece is the one that 
is the one that we're working on right now, the one that's on the podium on the music stand right now. But for me, process of invention is one of those pieces. And the memories that I have made by working on it with Chris, um, you know, they were they were truly special to me. And, you know, I wish I could phrase that even more, even, you know, or expand on that even more, like, you know, to find even more words to describe it, but they just were, um, were truly special. And then um, being able to record it uh, and then share it with the uh, YouTube, with the YouTube channel, uh, Vic Firth, um, I'll always remember for the rest of my life. And sorry, sorry, there's actually a third story that I actually wanted to share. Actually at that performance, um, when I was, it kind of hit me right before I played just who was in the audience and everything. Because there were, you know, it was a who's who of percussion because Chris had such a major impact on everything and on on the, um, you know, on, on the world and everything. And I, you know, right in the beginning, like my muscles were tense and I actually was shouting in my head, Chris, help me here. Help me out here. Help me relax here. And, you know, as yeah, you it, definitely it, had the hardest gig that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you killed well, it, man. You killed thank it. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, and thank you, Chris, for, you know, helping me to kind of just to, again, like you, like you had done for me so many times to peel me off the ceiling and everything uh, with that piece. And um, so all I can say is just thank you, Chris, for, for everything. Yeah, Tim, I just want to tell you, I was, that you inspired me to play that piece. I, I, I don't have the capability to learn most of Christopher's pieces, but that piece has always intrigued me. But that particular day was very special. So I'm going to make a point, at least learning some of it. <laughs> I may not complete it. but uh, I And you're a jazzer, so if you miss a note, just improv your way out. Exactly. <laughs> it, can, it can be a variation of invention, you know, oh, you know and, for a process. You know? And Christopher would, part, would dig it. Would, you know, he would. He totally would dig it. So maybe that's where I should go with it. Anyway, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I, I hate that you can say anything now because I, I want to respond to Tim. That it was such a beautiful story, and your performance was it moved me so that I, I, Miss Nose or whatever, I don't know what you're talking about. That was amazing. Thank you for that. It really, it's one of, there were so many moments, but that was a huge moment in the in the event. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, and I, I mean, the, you know, the reason that I shared that story was not necessarily to be like, well, you know you know, oh, you say it's great. Well, I didn't think, I, I, I was really happy with the performance and everything. It was, um, it was just kind of like a moment where I was, I felt like, I felt like Chris was kind of helping me, was helping me through it and everything and, you know, as, you know, and everything. So, um, but, you know, again, thank you all for the kind words and everything. Um, I, I will remember that concert for the rest, for the rest of my life. And it was uh, such a huge honor to be able to uh, collaborate with all of you on it, truly from the bottom of my heart. I just wanted to share really quickly, Mark Ford shared a hilarious story about, about that piece. Um, if anyone's not familiar, the beginning of the piece, both the hands are uh, in sync by split by a 16th note, but they're playing the same thing. And then the right hand starts uh, basically playing half speed or third speed or quarter speed. The right hand starts slowing down metrically against the left hand. And it's very, very, very challenging. Um, and when Ford was learning the piece, I think it was actually written for him, uh, he said that he learned that first section, recorded it, sent it to, to Chris, and uh, then they had a conversation, and Chris said, um, so you played the beginning beautifully, but I have to tell you, uh, you learned the right hand one sixteenth note off from where it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and Oops. Ford said there was a very long silence on the phone, and he said, okay. <laughs> And went back and had to unlearn that and then relearn it the correct way. So, but Carol, go ahead. I, I feel bad because we had we had a little moment there, and I guess we have to back up. But Ben, you might have to help me here because it was what you were saying that I wanted to reply to, and you were talking about. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase like what you said. You were just talking about not exactly agreeing with what Chris said and maybe having a yeah, slightly yeah. different approach. Am I getting that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, can I say something? <laughs> I, I swear to you, I, I was having this vision of Chris sitting right next to me. Because you guys have to remember, he was never Professor Dean to me, ever. He's my friend, my colleague. And I just had this vision of him looking at me and looking at each other and going, can you believe these guys? <laughs> and we're just laughing with him because um, he, would, well, he would relish that. He would absolutely relish that, that you have a different opinion. 
And I was going to say it didn't feel like it. <laughs> well, no, that's not. He and I, I wish I have to rewind your tape. I wish I could hear you, but the only I I don't have those ground quotes. He did not have those ground quotes. The other the other the other amazing thing I want to tell you is he was not a teacher when I knew him. He had no students. He had no students. So think about that. He had to come from somewhere to start somewhere. And, and you're reminding me of a quote that I heard from him a, a million years ago, which is so small. But in a way, it, it brought me to this realization. He, um, as I told you, he's up in his old beater van driving all over North Carolina, playing with all these crazy orchestras and doing all this stuff. And um, somehow, I don't know how we got talking about traffic jams because there were none back then. <laughs> I don't know how we were talking about that, being caught in traffic and sitting there. And I remember him taking a big sigh and saying, yeah, Carol, that's just my moment of sadness. And you know, that was long before John Stewart said it. You know, nobody else has said that. <laughs> he was the first. And 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 I was like, oh, this is a reflective moment. And I actually that's something that stuck with me because I, I think about that as a way to calm down if I get caught in traffic, I'm gonna take that moment to to do that. But that goes even further because, well, he would talk, we would talk about my teacher, one of my teachers was Michael Bookspan, who to me is the ultimate Zen master. And so Chris wanted to know tons of stuff about Bookspan that I was always telling him. But um, that's what it seems like when you were talking about him. I just, Chris is, 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 is so much that if you know him or not, I'm going to assure you that he is. And that and it, it, things just are, you know, there isn't a judgment there. There's no judgment there. They just are. And it's two sides of the same point. They just are. And this is as right as that. And, and, uh, and just to, to assure you of that, and I know you, by being asked to play the concert, felt this great sort of you know approval or whatever but i i guarantee you you had that right from the get-go and in fact when you probably first said something challenging to him i promise it's all it is. well thank you carol for for helping reassure my self-confidence <laughs> yeah like i said it was just you know you want your you want your teacher to say yes that's exactly it and you're doing great and it was like this you know, he never told me you're doing poorly. Um, Dr. Stroma did that, but uh, <laughs> I never got that. Never got that warm, fuzzy like. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree with how my my students acting here. Well, uh, changing gears a little bit, Brian. Um, you had uh, first of all, it was fantastic. I Brian Zader here. Uh, we got to play uh, Christopher's quartet. Vesper, Vespertine Formations, um, which is has always been one of my favorite pieces, and I never dreamed that I would ever get to play it with such an amazing group. It was Jason Baker, Sandy Rinnick, Brian Zader, and uh, me, um, and I mean, it was just so much fun to put together, um, and I think it was Carol mentioned like that, or you know, I think it was Tim said that that Dean Tribute concert is one that will just live in my memory forever um and i think that my favorite concert i've ever been in period was the 2006 unt wind ensemble pace concert they did this concert twice at north texas and once at PASIC. uh and i was at every single performance on the edge of my seat and this is the concert where keiko abe came and she played Prism Rhapsody with Mark Ford. Um, and at the end of the program, there was this piece I had never heard of called The Glory and the Grandeur by Russell Peck. And that piece was uh, Mark Ford, Christopher Dean, and Brian Zader performing. Um, and it was spectacular. It was one of the best performances I've ever seen. I still remember it was the first time I'd seen a Deegan artist special xylophone, and they had two of them on stage. And Brian and Chris had these crazy dueling xylophone licks. Uh, there's one section where all three performers are on marimba and Chris had this little mallet swish that he did. Um, I remember the opening of the piece, there's this raucous, uh, it's part of Russell Peck's piece, Lift Off, that he's put in the concerto and it ends with straight 16th notes, super loud and Chris turns the conductor and counts the conductor off, one, two, three. Um, and it was just, oh God, I just love that performance, love that piece so much. I was so inspired by it that, that I learned it with some friends in grad school and we got to perform it with both the orchestra and the band and I played Chris's part and I ripped off everything he did. I ripped off that little mallet swish and it was, <laughs> oh God, just so fantastic. So Brian, I've gone on and on about how, how great this performance was. 
tell us about performing this piece. Oh, and also they played it a couple years later with Lone Star Wind Orchestra, and I was at that performance as well. <laughs> so I, I don't think Brian, I need to. Why don't you about... just keep? Why don't you just keep talking, man? This is this is great. <laughs> this is wow. Man. I I freaking love this piece, and I, I there's a little. I won't give anything away, but I have this little nugget to perform it maybe in a couple years here, but you'll have to stay tuned for that. But Brian, tell us about your experience performing this piece with Chris. Who, by the way, went that, decades back with this piece? I, I know you're 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 kind of dating me a little bit on uh, on this one, but uh, um, it, that it, that experience was just absolutely incredible. And I I was I was actually a a, a DMA student at that time. So I started in 2003, graduated in 2008. But while I was doing my doctorate, I was also teaching full time at AM Commerce. So I started a and Commerce in 2001. So, um, so when they were organizing this concert, um, uh, I had done some stuff with Dean. I was kind of a, a quick fill-in in 2003 for the, the uh, at PASIC when he went and did Vespertine. They premiered that. They were also on the new music lit session. And an individual that was playing in that ensemble um, dislocated his shoulder, couldn't play. I had to come in, I learned the music in a week and played at PASIC 2003 uh, for Karel um, uh drum dances, I think it was, and learned that music. So- um, Well, if it was Huso, it was probably easy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fine. Yeah, it was just a couple little xylophone parts and everything, you know? So, uh, so fortunately, like that was kind of one of my first um, interactions with Chris after kind of the audition and when they were organizing this concert they were uh, talking about it and they used every North Texas um, like percussion like the full-time faculty that were there um, and for some reason Mark and Chris were like well we, we know Brian Zader he filled in on that 2003 thing and you know he's one of our DMA students and you know, he's also a teacher. He has his own gig. Let's do it. And they called it um, the UNT with UNT's own everybody there. So Doc, Mark, Chris, Paul, um, and then myself. Um, Did they claim Keiko Abe also? <laughs> so, well, she was actually the picture at the top. So she had the biggest picture on the poster. So I, I was the last one on the far right uh, in that uh, line of of the UNT zone, but uh, uh, such an honor to be to be part of that. And uh, what was great about all those rehearsals, Chris had performed this piece dozens of times. I mean, you were talking about, I saw Carol kind of have that reaction. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think Chris was on the premiere of the orchestra version, but I know he performed the orchestra versions quite a few times, whether it was in uh, North Carolina or it was up in, uh, uh, Cincinnati with Al and some of the uh, the percussion players, uh, the percussion group Cincinnati, I think maybe they might have premiered it. I don't think, I don't remember if Chris was a part of that or not, but he knew that piece backwards and forwards. And it was basically, he just, he was like, okay, learn your notes, come in and I'll tell you what we need to do. And I was like, Okay, and he he told us where to set up, and um, you know, and the angle at which the drums need to be, and putting the xylophones. The xylophones were face to face, right in the right in the front of the uh, the ensemble. So the dueling xylophones, you could, you know, we're kind of looking at each other. I go up, and he goes down, and then we're all going the same direction. So I mean, he knew that piece so darn well. And so that's what that's just what made it so much fun um, to to learn the piece. And I mean, we had you know I, I don't remember how many rehearsals. It wasn't a ton of rehearsals. And then um, and then we got to it. And basically, when we were doing it uh, with Gene uh, with Corporan, and um, and any time Corporan would ask a question, Mark and I would just kind of look over at Chris like, uh, do you? Would you mind answering that question? Because I think you are the you are the expert on this piece. So, um, so it was just such an incredible um, experience, and we played it. Uh, I have my list over here. Did it with North Texas at PASIC and at North Texas. There's a DVD of this as well, um, and uh, then we got invited 
to perform that piece. Uh, so the three of us went up to uh, Billings, Montana to play it with the symphony orchestra up there. Uh, we also went out to New Hampshire. They had a music festival um, and they invited us uh, to go over there. And I, I remember that one, <laughs> Ben, you were talking about these two beautiful Deegan artist specials. Uh, I don't remember which one it was, but they had, they had a, a Rosewood xylophone that might have been two and a half octaves and then an Acoustalon, a Yamaha Acoustalon xylophone. Oh no. <laughs> I'm sure the Rosewood one was in great condition too. That's oh. that's some blend for you right there. <laughs> oh my gosh! So they were like, "Well, well, Xander, did you march drum corps? Didn't you? Why, why did you play on the acoustic line? You know how to you know how to play on that." <sighs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Is that the one that had the green bars on it too, and everything? <laughs> Dude, it was. It had what bars? Green, did, weren't they, didn't they have like green bars on them or something or the, that particular model or? No, this was, it was the, the brown, but it was the plastic, it was the plastic bars and everything. And so, you know, I was playing like this high off the, off the board because you get too oh. high and then that, like you won't even hear the orchestra uh, type of thing. So, um, but it was, I mean, that experience was great. And, and what was really special about that is Mark, Chris and I just, you know, really just created a relationship uh, through that experience. And we've, we've done quite a bit after that. Um, uh, we're able to do quite a bit after that, but just that, that experience, just um, me young in my career also, and for Chris and Mark to, to take a chance with, uh, with, this, with this young guy that, uh, um, you know, he's just kind of doing his doctorate, young in his college teaching career, and that 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 experience was something that uh, you know I look back on, and I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Chris and Mark really taking a ch taking a chance uh, with me to having having the faith that I that I could do uh, that I could do that, and um, so yeah, just to just really help to set set things off for me. I was just going to add, I, I was talking about people with strong opinions, and Eugene Corporon, the conductor of that, uh, is one of them. Uh, and I, I remember mm -hmm. Dean told me that uh, there, that xylophone battle section, I remembered uh, Russell Peck, the composer, came to the you know final rehearsals in the concert, and he said that the tempos were marked 180 or something just ridiculously fast. And I think Dean had kind of asked to slow it down and Corporon said, nope, this is the tempo it says, that's the tempo I'm conducting. And finally Peck got there and said, uh, are you guys just like trying to like blow through the section to get to the next thing in rehearsal or, or what's <laughs> what's going on with that? And he was like, well, it's the tempo you were. He was like, well, well don't do that. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was actually, I think that was in the, the main hall too. Yeah, oh, and I'm sure at that point, Brian and Chris breathe a sigh of relief that they could at least catch some <laughs> of the right notes. <laughs> Dude, it was so fast. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Carol, I think you had something to add about uh, Chris's early days with this piece. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, and yes, sort of. Do you guys know who you're talking about, Russell Peck? You know where yeah. he's from? Yeah, where? of course, North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and his, by the way, his, uh, his music publishing company is, uh, he's passed away, but the company is spectacular music which i love <laughs> so if you don't think he tried to every single piece he ever wrote tried to play it out here first you you, you, you know guess again of course he did so i'm sure i chris probably played in greensboro or something i don't even know i know he's always knocking on our door we made fun of him but i'm glad you like the pieces <laughs> he's he's kind of a I'm glad he didn't show up till the dress rehearsal that's good let you do what you want that's all good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it was it was great to to be able to to meet him. And this was the, the world premiere of the of the wind ensemble version of, oh, okay. of that piece. Yep. So the orchestra version been played all around the world. And this was the it's the first time that the the uh, yeah, there was a wind ensemble that um, Russell had fixed it and everything and um, and and moved it over. And so um, but yeah, the, the, that trio with me, Mark, and Chris was just, um, we, did, we did that piece, and then um, in 2009 with... Uh, that trio you did at PASIC was so cool. 
<laughs> now I'm just blanking on the name of the piece. Is it um, is it Sea of Clouds or is that another one of his pieces? No, that's Sensing the Coriolis was in 2016 was the marimba it wasn't topo topography of dreaming was it topography of dreaming that's was what it is, vibes, yeah. vibe and two marimbas and so um uh so and the the trio we actually we, we we figured that we had to have a name and so it was nt3 percussion trio so and by the way i wanted to add that piece brian was talking about the the trio it was vibraphone chris was on a uh, vibraphone and then Ford and Zader on marimbas, and it was like a bow in one hand and playing oh, playing stuff with mallets and the other. It was so cool, and I remember that was right after I graduated. It was my first year of grad school, but I, I saw it at PASIC, and oh god, that piece was awesome. And I don't no, I think I did see one other group performed it, but oh god, what an underplayed piece! It's, it's genius. It's and still one of those. To... Sorry, ahead, ben, sorry, keep on. Sorry, I was gonna say it's, we talked on the last episode about. Like every time he I'm wrote just, a piece, he reinvented the idiom. And that's like no exception. It's such a cool piece. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. I, I just, one of my regrets is I always wanted to ask him what like the inspiration of where that title came. Cause it's also, it's one of the coolest pieces in our rep. It's also one of the coolest titles ever. And I always yes. wanted to find out like, so where I've got, I've got ideas of where it might've come from, but I still, I never got to ask him like where this all came from even. It's such a great piece. Well, I, I wish I could tell you, um, because I mean, we, we were the ones that played it. I wish I could tell you where that came from, um, but I, and I'm going to have to disappoint you on that one. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but, that's okay. Uh, but yeah, that, that piece is definitely needs to be one that that's published and per performed out there. Cause that is such a, we played it. It was a music festival in Dallas that we played it at. And then we played it at, uh, at PASIC and everything. Um, uh, yeah, it was such such a cool such a cool piece. It it's funny talking about his his writing. Um, so after I left North Texas and I was at Kentucky, we won the call for tapes, and Jim was asking, talking to the grad students about who do we want to commission. And so I I pitched. I was like, well, imagine if we asked Christopher Dean to write a large ensemble work. Imagine what that would be like, Jim. And he, he bought into it. But I still had to laugh at the fact that when we got the music, it was handwritten. And then he would send us edits. And it was very, very obvious that he was taking the score, Xeroxing the score, cutting the notes out of the score, taping them to more part, like to make the marimba two part. But then he would have all of these like notes, like repeat and then handwritten like five times and where, because he would just, oh, I want that longer. Blah. And it would just constantly kept changing and changing and changing to the point where the hour before the performance at PASIC, he was standing there and really debating changing something and it was on a part i was playing one of the timpani parts for pyro flagathon and he was like i, I, don't, I don't know I, and we were like what do you want man like what he's like i don't I, and we were just like man just tell us like what do you want like we'll do it it's totally cool we know we know that we know we premiered this in 10 minutes but it's cool man whatever like, well could you maybe do this it was it was like man to the 11th hour with that guy and that's why we love it I was going to say the man was a genius in so many ways, but music notation software was not one of them. <laughs> and I think that's, I've got a few of his pieces. Go ahead. I've got a few of them and they're all notated by someone else. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. all engraved by someone say, else. Though, how many, how many quote unquote composers now they like just put it in finale and they like endlessly edit until they get something that sounds cool. And uh, you know, it's like no, no ears at all. No mental process. Like, I think that actually demonstrates how genius he was that he was able to invent all of that inside his own head and then write it out on a piece of paper. And if he changed his ideas, it was not a small edit. It was rewriting his own piece of paper. So yeah, Tim, I think you had something. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of also wanted to share this other story um, about Chris, you know, cause you know, earlier in the, in the discussion uh, we've had so many stories about like how much he did for, his friends and how much he did for his students. And my second DMA recital happened the same evening as an ice storm in Denton. In Denton. 
And um, although, and so they had shut down the university, but the recording services people were still there. So they gave me the choice of whether I would, um, whether I could do the recital or not. And so I said, I'm ready. Like I'm ready to do this recital. So I did the recital in Bortman Hall. And then after that, like the university had completely shut down. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with, um, with UNT, uh, the percussion studio, we call it room 142. Uh, 142 was locked and the students did not have key access to it and this the ice was piling up and everything we had all these instruments it got accidentally locked at the end of the recital and so um, we called Chris and Chris came back braving the ice in his Dodge blue navy blue Dodge caravan back to the music building and unlocked the unlock 142 so we could get all the instruments back and you know he he just did so much for us, you know, including risking life and limb and everything to try and, uh, you know, make sure that we had everything that that we uh, that we needed and everything. And, you know, I would I would um, I would regret if I did not share that story. Um, you know, that was 100 percent Chris. You know, that was that was him, the teacher, the mentor and the friend. Well, Tim, that beautifully dovetails into the last story I wanted to share here. Uh, I asked anyone online if they wanted to share a story, and uh, Graham Vigut, who is a UNT, I believe, grad student, uh, wrote to me, and um, I'm just going to read what Graham said. He says, Dean was teaching UNT's percussion literature class in spring of 21. He spent most of the semester teaching on Zoom, and one of my favorite classes when, was when we looked at John Cage's Child of Tree and talked about amplified cactus and Cage's compositional techniques. Naturally, when Dean came to campus for our final exam, I decided to bring him a, a present, a small cactus plant. He seemed pretty amused and appreciative of it after a semester that wasn't the best due to the pandemic. However, a month or two later from, in the summer, I got this email from him, and the email reads, Hi, Graham. I hope the summer is going well for you. Nice to have a break. By the way, thank you so much for our cactus plant. It seems happy in our home and is a real joy to look at. I remember you saying you wanted to play Morning Dove Sonnet. I can give you a copy. Do you know if anyone will be anywhere near school this somewhere? You can either pick up a copy from me at my home, which is not too far from school, or I can leave you one on my door at school. Just let me know what works. And Graham said, just a short note saying the cactus is happy is in our home, but made me smile so much because I can imagine his slightly bemused expression and how caring he was to remember so many details about his students. So with that, I think we will wrap up for the day. Thank you so much, everyone that helped out, participated in this session, and we look forward to seeing everyone on the next episode. Thank you so much.